All right, so almost all we have left for this one are the muscles of the lower leg. So there's 12 muscles. Um, so this is where we left off last time, was talking about the arches of the foot. So before we get into that, so we talked um, about several joints last time, but we talked a lot about the talocrural and the subtalar joint. Do either of you happen to remember what actions happen at the talocrural joint? And if no, that's okay. So, go ahead. Okay, so remember that the talocrural joint, tib, fib, talus, right? And so that is one of the two primary joints of the ankle complex. So the talocrural joint, that's where you get plantar flexion, where you come up on your toes, and dorsiflexion, where you bring your toes back toward your head. And then the subtalar joint, it's actually pictured here. Actually, the talocrural joint is here as well. So the talocrural joint's up here. So again, so we're just looking at the medial view of the foot. So here's the tibia, and then there's the talus. So talocrural joint's here, and then the subtalar joint is down here. So it's the interaction between the talus, which is this bone, and then the calcaneus, which is your heel bone. So at the subtalar joint, that's where you get inversion, eversion. So remember, inversion is where the calcaneus rolls toward your midline how you sprain your ankle, eversion is the other way. So the calcaneus rolls away from the midline. And so that joint is gonna be particularly important for the weight bearing ability of the foot, or really the weight distribution ability of the foot. So when the calcaneus is in inversion, so when it's rolled toward the midline, then the foot is effectively locked. When the calcaneus rolls toward the midline, when it rolls into inversion, that's gonna push all those tarsal bones together and to some extent the metatarsals, so the foot is nice and rigid. When the calcaneus rolls the other way, when it drops into eversion, that's gonna allow those bones of the foot, particularly the tarsal bones, to spread out. And the foot's kind of loose and floppy is a way to think about that. And so that subtalar joint in particular affects the shape of some of these arches. So especially the medial longitudinal arch here. So remember the medial longitudinal arch runs from this medial aspect of the calcaneus all the way down to the head of the first metatarsal. So it's the big arch of the foot. So when somebody talks about they have high arches or fallen arches, et cetera, they're talking about the medial longitudinal arch. And so that's dictated by that subtalar joint, largely. There are other joints that play a role, but, but in large part, that's dictated by the subtalar joint. So for example, this person has really flat feet. So they have completely collapsed their medial longitudinal arch. So if we looked at them from the posterior aspect, we'd see that their calcaneus has fallen into eversion. And so as it does that, that again is gonna allow those tarsal bones to spread out, that medial longitudinal arch collapses. And so then you get, um, yeah, you can see this is their navicular, it's really prominent. Um, and so that navicular has really rolled and it's actually touching the ground there. So that foot is basically, it's too loose. They have a hypermobile subtalar joint, it moves too much, the, the talus, uh, sorry, the calcaneus falls too far into eversion. And so that's when you've got those flat feet, right? And so effectively what, what this person has is their feet are always in weight acceptance mode. So we're in, all of, of us are in this, but not to this extent, whenever you are in what's called mid stance, which is when you are standing directly on one leg right over the top of that foot, that's mid stance. So all of us, our calcaneus is everted and we are like this, but not quite to that extent. So this person is a little too mobile in their subtalar joint. On the other hand, this person is not mobile enough in their subtalar joint. So their calcaneus on the right is stuck in inversion. And so basically their foot is stuck locked. Um, and so all those bones are really pushed together. So uh, the person on the right side, because of that inverted calcaneus, that really high medial longitudinal arch, they're gonna be much more likely to get stress fractures because the foot isn't really very good at distributing um, impact forces across the connective tissue of the foot. Um, and instead you get a lot of vibration forces going up into the lower leg and especially into the fibula as opposed to the person on the left with the really flat feet, they're gonna get, uh, they'll probably have some shin splints and they're probably gonna have some problems with plantar fasciitis. All right, speaking of. All right, so uh, case study I've got for you. So we're gonna pretend that you're an athletic trainer and you are working at a high school and you have a 16 year old male cross country runner comes to you complaining of heel pain. And we're gonna pretend that it's August, so it's early in the cross country season he comes to you and tells you that over the past couple weeks, he's had pain on the anterior medial aspect of his heel. So kind of toward the front of his heel bone and on the, the inside of his arch. Um, and that it's a really sharp stabbing kind of a pain. And he notices that the pain is the worst first thing in the morning. So especially first few steps out of bed, just like, oh, I feel like somebody's stabbing him in his heel. 
And then also after he sits in class, so when he's just been sitting for a while, first couple steps, stabbing pain again. But once he's up and going for a little while, it does get better. And in terms of when it hurts, like I said, it hurts after he's been resting, but in terms of when in the gait cycle it hurts, so when in the walking or running cycle it hurts, is when he's in what's called heel off. So heel off is when you go to push yourself into the next step and your, your big toe is still on the ground, but your heel is off of the ground. We'll talk about this a lot on Monday. And so when he does that, when he's in that plantar flex position, that's when he really gets that stabbing in his foot. Any guesses as to what he might have going on? Pain on the bottom of the foot with an overuse injury, or that is an overuse injury. Classic example of plantar fasciitis. So plantar fasciitis, um, pretty common. Um, so you get it um, in your endurance athletes, largely. So in our cross country runner early season, it's probably, he wasn't conditioned enough. So he probably had a big increase in both volume of training. So number of miles, but also the intensity of the training. He's running faster than he was used to running. And so ended up with an overuse injury uh, in the bottom of his foot in the plantar fascia. We also see it in people that have to stand all day, especially people that stand all day in crappy shoes. Um, back before I moved, when I lived in Austin, I used to go to this old school uh, barber shop where they did like straight razor shaves and all that stuff. And I would always go to the same lady who never remembered me. And like every time I would go to go, you know, sit down in the chair, she'd ask me what I did for a living. So I told her I was a professor in exercise science. And so then she would always tell me about her heel pain every single time. <laughs> And so she had plantar fasciitis and she had plantar fasciitis because she wore, had old busted crappy broken down shoes and then she stood all day and so the plantar fascia is pictured in green there it's a band of connective tissue that runs from the medial aspect of the calcaneus and it actually splits so it's one broad band of connective tissue and then it splits to all five toes and it inserts on the proximal phalanx of each digit and so the job of the plantar fascia is to kind of be like a rubber band on the bottom of your foot. So whenever you move into that heel off position, where again, you're pushing yourself into the next step and your heel is off the ground, but your toes are still on the ground, that is gonna stretch the plantar fascia. Cause again, it, it's gonna cross into uh, the proximal phalanx of each toe. And so then as you move from heel off, where your heel's off the ground to toe off, where you actually push off the ground, the plantar fascia recoils a little bit. So like I said, it's kind of like a rubber band. So it stretches back into its original shape and that helps push you into the next step. So the plantar fascia helps take some of the load off the muscles by acting as a rubber band on the bottom of the foot, helping the foot recoil. But the other thing that it does is when you're standing, it also takes some load off the muscles. It keeps those arches from collapsing. But if you're standing all day in non-supportive footwear, that calcaneus kind of slowly rolls in eversion a little bit, puts more stress on the plantar fascia. And so then that can cause some irritation at its origin there on the calcaneus. So almost always when somebody has plantar fasciitis, they complain of the sharp stabbing pain like right there, right on that front part of their calcaneus. So you can find the, the, the soft area in the middle of their foot and just go back to where you can first feel their heel. And that's usually where they're gonna describe the pain to you. And so the issue there again is that, that um, we talked about the concept of creep, low intensity stress, long duration. And so that's what you've got with plantar fasciitis a lot of the time is they're just standing there um, putting a little bit of tension on the plantar fascia and so eventually it starts to pull away from its origin there on the calcaneus you get inflammation and irritation also when people talk about they got heel spurs um, so you hear that sometimes usually bone spurs in the heel are related to plantar fasciitis or repetitive or prolonged pulling on the plantar fascia all right so let's talk about muscles so in the lower leg there are 12 muscles um, so this one the picture there is actually a left leg um, now that I think about that. I always try to show you the right, but this happens to be a picture of the left. And so what you've got here, this is a, a transverse or horizontal plane cut of the lower leg. So it's about midway through the shin. And so what you're looking at here, so obviously this is the tibia, because this is the, the more medial of the two bones. So again, left leg. Um, and so this is the anterior aspect of the front, posterior aspect of the back is down here. So tibia here, inner osseous membrane, and then fibula is here. So the lower leg, um, probably the easiest way to, to remember the muscles is by their compartments. Well, the first question, of course, is what is a compartment? So the muscles are, are bound off into groups of, of somewhere between two and four muscles by a band of connective tissue. So there's three different bands of connective tissue in the lower leg. They're referred to as septa, uh, it's plural, septum is singular. Um, so if you're playing with the connective tissue function on the anatomy app, you'll see 
um, the anterior, posterior, and transverse septa. Those are the, are the connective tissue that divide the uh, lower leg into its different compartments. So for example, the anterior compartment includes four muscles, but because of where this cross section is, you can only see three of them. So here are the three muscles. And then you've got this band of connective tissue here that goes across the front of the, of the leg. And then you've got tibia, fibula, and the interosseous membrane. So those four muscles are bound together in that compartment. And not only are there muscles in that compartment, but there's also an artery, nerve, and vein. And so in the case of the anterior compartment, that artery, nerve, and vein are kind of back here toward the posterior aspect of the compartment. So the anterior compartment's up here. Lateral compartment's over here. There's only two muscles in it, the two perineal muscles. Then we have posterior superficial through here. And then a posterior deep, which is these three muscles here. And then there's their artery, nerve, and vein. So why does that matter? Um, one, because like I said, it's an easy way to group them. But two, those groups of fascia or those bands of fascia are not very stretchy. They don't have a lot of give to them. And so what ends up happening is if there's swelling in that compartment, let's say swelling in the anterior compartment, the muscles are going to try to push out, but they can't because of that really dense fascia. And so when they swell, they push in on the softest stuff in the compartment, kind of like what we talked about with carpal tunnel syndrome. And so the softest things in the compartment then are an artery, nerve, and vein. And so swelling in the compartment then can cut off blood flow distal to that site, so into the foot, um, and it can also cut off nerve supply into the foot. So that's referred to as compartment syndrome. Um, fairly common injury. So there's two types of compartment syndrome. The first is acute or traumatic. So you see that sometimes like in soccer, if, if athletes aren't wearing their, their shin guards, or you see it in football too, um, if somebody just gets kicked in the lower leg. So if you get kicked in the shin, um, especially in the meat of that muscle, or the muscles there on the front of your shin, again, it'll cause them to swell, and then they'll try to push out. They can't, so then they'll push in on the artery, nerve, and vein, and it'll cut off blood supply to their foot. And so then that can be an emergency, because anytime you've got a reduction in blood supply, then potentially you have an emergency condition. The other one, uh, the exertional compartment syndrome, is more predictable. It typically happens 30 to 45 minutes into exercise, and it's because of the swelling of the musculature with exercise. So as you start to work out, or you start to run, um, in particular, you get increased blood flow to the muscles, they're going to swell, and so then that swelling causes um, compression of the artery, nerve, and vein. So they usually they report to you weakness and tingling in the foot. That goes away when, when they stop exercising. All right, so the way I laid the muscles out then is by compartment. So uh, anterior compartments first. There are four muscles in that compartment, and so the first one in the anterior compartment is our tibialis anterior muscle. So there's two tibialis muscles, an anterior and a posterior. Um, so this is tibialis anterior. And so you can see its origin there has a fairly big origin, uh, mostly along the tibia, but also onto the interosseous membrane. And then one of the things about tibialis anterior is that its tendon runs down and actually inserts on the bottom of the foot or on the plantar aspect of the foot. So if I group it in with the other muscles, you can see the way it actually, the tendon, again, wraps medially underneath the foot and inserts there on the, the uh, medial cuneiform and the first metatarsal, which is going to be the same insertion, for what it's worth, for one of the perineal muscles. So if that helps you memorize the insertions. So in terms of the actions, so um, tibialis anterior is a dorsiflexor, so picks your foot up. And so remember, dorsiflexion happens at the talocrural joint, so that's what the TC stands for. And then it is also an inverter at the subtalar joint. So that's what the ST stands for. So dorsiflexion, talocrural, inversion, subtalar. So um, tibialis anterior, we talked about, this is the muscle that's almost always affected in shin splints. And the reason for that is during walking and running, um, whenever you hit the ground, the first thing that usually hits the ground with most people's gait is their heel. And so whenever your heel hits the ground, your foot tends to kind of drop against the ground, right? So the plantar aspect of your foot ten would tend to slap against the ground. But to prevent that, we got to put on the brakes to keep, that's called foot slap. To prevent that foot slap, we got to put on the brakes. And so we do that with tibialis anterior especially. So it's going to contract eccentrically, meaning it's going to contract but lengthen to slow our foot down as we then step over the top of it. So that's why this one tends to get irritated with, with um, an overload in terms of, or big change in terms of the volume of training. So if you go from doing nothing to doing a lot of running and it brings on shin splints, the reason for that is because it's not used to those repetitive eccentric contractions. And so that causes irritation of the muscle and then irritation of its origin along the tibia. And so then that's where you get that 
periostitis, usually here along the shaft of the tibia. All right, so there's tibialis anterior. Then we have our extensor hallucis longus. So uh, it tells you what it does. Obviously, it's an extensor. Um, the other thing is anything hallux deals with the big toe. Just like anything pollux was the thumb, hallux is the big toe. So same concept in the foot. So extensor hallucis tells you that it extends the big toe. Um, and in addition to that, it is also a dorsiflexor in an inverter of the foot. Its tendon runs really close to the tendon of uh, tibialis anterior, but they split kind of across the midpoint of the medial longitudinal arch. So you can see the origin there, medial surface of the fibula and the interosseous membrane. Again, that band of connective tissue between the bones. And then it's going to insert all the way down the distal phalanx, but on the dorsal aspect or the top of the foot. Um, and so it's going to be a dorsiflexor, talocurl, inverter, subtalar, extensor, MTP, so metatarsophalangeal, and then extensor, IP, the interphalangeal joint of the big toe. So lots of different things for it. And then if we put it with the other muscles, you can see it's kind of deep to, or at least the, the more superior or proximal portion of it is deep to tibialis anterior and extensor digitorum. So it kind of just pokes out between those two near the lower part of the leg. And then again, its tendon runs all the way down here to the distal aspect of the big toe. So that's extensor hallucis longus. And then we have extensor digitorum longus. So extensor digitorum longus um, is pretty similar to the one that we saw in the hand. So it's similar in that it has one belly, obviously, and then that belly's tendon splits into four. So it goes to all the toes that are not the big toe. And so you can see its tendon split better on this picture. So this is kind of a three quarter lateral view of the right leg. But you can see that tendon split where one goes to the pinky tendon, to the fourth toe, third toe, and then second toe. And you can see the dorsal expansion on there, or dorsal aponeurosis. There's a dorsal expansion on the foot too. Uh, so it's very similar to the one that we saw in the hand. So in terms of its actions, so extensor digitorum is a dorsiflexor. Um, this, the anatomy app has it listed as an everter, um, so we'll go with that. Normally, every other source I've seen basically regards it as being neutral with respect to inversion, eversion, but We'll stick with what the anatomy app has. So eversion, subtalar, and then extension, MTP, PIP, DIP, so all the toe um, joints for digits two through five. So all the, all the ones that are not the big toe. And then the last muscle in the anterior compartment, which again, you couldn't see on that first picture, but it is in the anterior compartment, is our peroneus tertius. So the anatomy app always refers to him as fibularis, which is fine, um, but I learned him as peroneus. So both terms are correct, and I learned peroneus, so I, I always refer to him as peroneus. Um, so peroneus tertius is one of the three perineal muscles. Anything uh, perineal deals with the fibula. So peroneus tertius originates pretty distally or, uh, down on the fibula. So you can see dorsal, uh, sorry, the anterior surface of the distal fibula, and then it's going to insert on the base of the fifth metatarsal just actually kind of just anterior to the base, closer to the shaft. And so it is both a dorsiflexor and an everter. So one of the things to know about the anterior compartment muscles is that all of their tendons run in front of the malleoli. So remember last time we talked about the medial malleolus, which is that distal extension of the tibia, the lateral malleolus, the distal extension of the fibula. And so anything whose tendons run in front of the malleolus is going to be a dorsiflexor. Anything whose tendons or any muscle whose tendons run behind the malleolus is going to be a plantar flexor. So the, all of the four anterior compartment muscles are dorsiflexors. Everything else, the remaining eight, are plantar flexors. So those are our anterior compartment muscles. And there's peroneus tertius. So it's a pretty little muscle. Um, the way to find it, and you can, on some people, if they're really lean, you can see it on their foot. Um, basically what it looks like is there's the, the extensor digitorum tendon to the fifth is usually pretty obvious, and then there's kind of this stray tendon that just goes off the side of their foot, and that's peroneus tertius. You can make it pop out more if you evert the foot forcefully. All right, so now we're moving on to the lateral compartment. There's only two muscles in the lateral compartment, and so uh, those are both of your perineal muscles um, in addition to peroneus tertius. So the first one is peroneus longus, 
And so what makes Peronius longus longus is that it originates fairly proximal. So it's going to originate fairly high up on the fibula. Um, and then the other thing that makes it longus is that its tendon actually runs underneath the foot. So it runs next to the cuboid behind the base of the fifth, runs underneath the foot, and as mentioned, inserts on the same two bones that the tibialis anterior inserted. So it inserts on the medial cuneiform and the base of the first. So in terms of putting it with the other muscles, so again, here's peroneus longus. Its tendon runs behind that lateral malleolus and then up underneath the foot, and we can't see its insertion because, again, it's, it's underneath the foot, so it's on the plantar aspect and also on the medial aspect of the foot. So in terms of actions, there are two. The first is plantar flexion, talo curl, so it's going to help you stand up on your tippy toes. And then the other one is eversion, subtalar, so it pulls your calcaneus away from the midline. And then peroneus longus has a brother, neighbor, whatever, a very similar muscle along with it. That is peroneus brevis. Oops, went the wrong way, sorry. Oh no, I gotta redo my slideshow. I put tertius on there twice. Anyway, we got peroneus uh, brevis on there. So I actually have the correct muscle pictured on there and I have the correct actions and everything. Um, it should just say brevis here instead of tertius. So that should be peroneus brevis. And then, like I said, this is the correct muscle pictured. Um, anyway, so peroneus brevis, a little bit shorter than longus, uh, so it originates farther distally. And then its tendon of insertion isn't quite as long. The tendon of insertion for peroneus brevis is on the base of the fifth metatarsal. So if we put it in with all the other muscles, there is its insertion at the base of the fifth. And so it is also a plantar flexor and everter of the foot. So both of the muscles of the lateral compartment, peroneus longus and peroneus brevis, are plantar flexors and everters. And then all three perineal muscles, so peroneus brevis, longus, and tertius, are everters of the foot. So one of the important things to know then, all the perineal muscles are everters of the foot. And why that matters is that the perineal muscles are the, the primary restraints against an inversion ankle sprain. So whenever you step off a curb wrong, or you step on somebody's foot or something like that, you've probably noticed that you sort of, uh, you reflexively correct your bad foot position. So as your foot starts to roll into inversion, you'll get a reflexive muscle contraction to pull it back into uh, eversion. So as you go into inversion, the perineals pull you into eversion. And so they then help put you back in that good position, help um, prevent you from reaching end range of motion where you would actually sprain the ligaments. So the perineal muscles are the ones that protect us against a lateral ankle sprain. At the same time though, if you actually sprain your ankle, you're gonna damage not only, we talked last time about the ATFL, CFL, PTFL, but if you sprain your ankle, not only are you gonna damage the ligaments, but you're also gonna damage the perineal muscles. And so one of the things that happens, we talked a little bit about the concept of once a sprain, always a sprain. And so one of the things that happens in the ankle is that whenever you overstretch the perineals during an ankle sprain, they're less sensitive to that stretch. You damage some sensory structures in them called uh, muscle spindles, which we'll talk about with the uh, peripheral nervous system. So you damage the muscle spindles, you're less aware of where that joint is in space, you're less aware of the muscles being overstretched. And so there's this, this lag time after you've sprained your ankle once, there's a lag time in the perineal muscles putting you back into that everted position. So that's one of the reasons that you tend to sprain your ankle repeatedly after you do it the first time. Um, Another common thing related to the perineals are Jones fractures, or actually technically pseudo-Jones fractures. So a Jones fracture is a, a fracture of the base of the fifth metatarsal. So what you're looking at here, it's the left foot from the top. Um, and so you can see this is the, the fifth metatarsal here. And so this is the base. And so now we're getting on to the diaphysis or the shaft. And so obviously here's the fracture site. So that's a true Jones fracture. And what's happened there is either somebody has, in this case, probably somebody has stepped on their foot or they've dropped something on their foot. Um, you can also get stress fractures that are Jones fractures. So it's less common than like the second metatarsal. That's usually where you get metatarsal stress fractures. But you can get them in the shaft of the fifth, which is a Jones fracture. But how it relates to our current discussion is you can get a pseudo Jones fracture, which is, and you can see, so same basic picture, and you can see this little crack right here. And so that's a fracture that is secondary to, or as a result of, a lateral ankle sprain. So whenever this person sprained their ankle, 
both of their per or all three of their perineal muscles tried to contract to keep them from falling too far into inversion. And basically, peroneus brevis contracted so hard that it pulled away at its insertion there in the base of the fifth and caused the bone to crack. So the tendon was still in good shape, but it actually the, the failure was in the bone. So that's called a pseudo Jones fracture whenever the, the peroneus brevis uh, cracks the bone from contracting too hard. And then the other thing is the perineal retinaculum, which is highlighted in green for you there. So the perineal retinaculum, any sort of a retinaculum is a, is a connective tissue structure that runs perpendicular to tendons. So it runs at a 90 degree angle to tendons. And so, or close to a 90 degree angle, this one's more of a 45. Um, but anyway, so here's the perineal retinaculum. And so um, it's gonna hold down both of those tendons behind the lateral malleolus. And so one of the things that you can see after somebody sprains their ankle, and in addition to damaging ATFL, CFL, uh, straining the, the perineals, et cetera, you can also, if those muscles contract too strongly, they can basically rupture this retinaculum. And so what that does then is it allows those tendons to move across the lateral malleolus. So every time they plantar flex, the tendons are gonna snap back and forth across their lateral malleolus, which includes every time they walk, when they go to push off, you get some, some subluxation or some movement of those tendons which then causes them to get inflamed. So it is fairly problematic. Um, and so there's no really good way to fix that other than surgery. Um, it's just kind of an irritating sort of a thing. So there's a tape, uh, a way to tape for it, but it doesn't really do anything. Um, so anyway, and there's some interesting, if you wanna see what it looks like, there's some videos on YouTube. If you uh, search for perineal tendon subluxation, you can watch people click them back and forth if you're into that sort of thing, but I'll save you the video. All right. So that's the lateral compartment and the perineals. Now we're on to the posterior superficial compartment because there's posterior superficial, three muscles in that, and posterior deep, three, three muscles in that. So in the posterior superficial compartment, we've got one of the muscles we've talked about before, which is gastrocnemius. Remember we talked about gastrocnemius with the knee. It's the superficial calf muscle, the one that has kind of a W shape if it's well-developed in people. And so it has two heads, medial head, lateral head, arising each from just above the condyle of the femur on the medial and lateral side, respectively. And then those two heads come together, common tendon of insertion. Um, I always refer to it as the Achilles tendon, um, but this one refers to it as the calcaneal tendon, which is fine too. Um, but just know if I say Achilles, I'm talking about the same tendon. So those two heads come together, insert via the Achilles into the posterior aspect of the calcaneus, which again is your heel bone. So gastroc has two actions, flexion at the tibiofemoral joint, which is the knee, and then plantar flexion, so bringing you up on your toes, the most powerful plantar flexor, um, in, at the talocrural joint. So it's a plantar flexor there. And then deep to gastroc is our next muscle, which is soleus. So soleus, oops, forgot about plantaris which is appropriate because plantaris doesn't do much. Um, so plantaris originates from that lateral supracondylar ridge, so just above the lateral condyle of the femur. Again, we talked about this one with the knee, has a pretty small little belly there and a long feathery little tendon. So there's its little belly, there's its long tendon. It actually runs in with the Achilles tendon. And so it inserts with gastroc and soleus via the Achilles into the dorsum of the calcaneus. So its actions include flexion at the knee, and then plantar flexion at the talocrural joint. So flexion TF, plantar flexion TC. And then we get to the soleus. So the soleus, um, big muscle, broad origin. So it originates along the soleal line. Uh, there's some part of the origin on the interosseous membrane and then also along the fibula. So it again runs into the Achilles and inserts in the dorsum of the calcaneus, and it is also a powerful plantar flexor. So a few differences between gastroc and soleus. One is that gastroc crosses the knee, soleus does not. And so if you're into like bodybuilding-esque stuff, if you do like, if you do standing calf raises, that engages both gastroc and soleus, but gastroc more. And then if you do plantar flexion with the knee flex, so if you do like seated calf raises, that's more of a soleus type of an activity because you're putting slack in the gastroc. Um, the other things about those two, um, so soleus has more type one fibers. 
So more slow twitch fibers. So it's more of a postural muscle. So as I'm just standing here at the front of the classroom, I'm using primarily soleus to keep my ankle in a neutral position and keep me from falling over. Gastroc, because it has more type two fibers, is one that we engage more if we're doing really powerful plantar flexion. So like jumping, sprinting, those kinds of things. So that's the difference between those two. Another thing I should mention, so gastroc of course has two heads, soleus basically has one. Those two run together. And so sometimes those two are referred to as triceps surae, S-U-R-A-E. So if you ever see the term triceps surae, it's referring to the combination of gastrocnemius and soleus. And again, because they both insert uh, via the Achilles into the calcaneus. So those are your most powerful plantar flexors. And there's soleus. You can also see soleus from the side. So next one's a side view. So again, it's deep to gastroc, so that yellow muscle there is your soleus. So the people that have a really well-developed lower leg, sometimes on, on the lateral aspect of their lower leg, you can see their soleus. So you know your sprinters, cross-country runners, those kinds of athletes, sometimes you can see their soleus when they're walking. All right, so quick scenario. So we're going to pretend, and this actually happened uh, in my when I was interning in baseball as a strength and conditioning coach, um, at one of the games, we had a guy who's our third baseman, and he hit a ball into the right field corner, and he was trying to stretch that into a triple. And so as he was rounding second, kind of like this guy is, his foot hit the bag, and he just collapsed, like just fell, you know, just fell out. And he's just laying there on the, on the dirt on his stomach. And so me and the athletic trainer go jogging out there. I don't remember why I got to jog out there, but I did. So I go jogging out there with the athletic trainer. And so we're talking to him, we're like, you know, what happened? And he was like, I don't know, like, I think the ball hit me. And we're like, no, the ball's still out in right field. Like, that can't be the ball hit you. And he's like, well, like, I feel like somebody kicked me or something. I'm like, no, nobody kicked you. There's nobody anywhere around you. And so he said, well, it's just like, I feel like something hit me in the back of my leg and something snapped, right? And then so then severe pain and all of that kind of stuff. And you can probably guess what's going on. Yeah, so he snapped his Achilles, right? And so um, that's what happened with him. And so what ends up happening most of the time with uh, Achilles ruptures is that, and the reason it happened to him is when you hit the base like that, as this guy's about to, sometimes that forced dorsiflexion, so you're really stretching those muscles out, and it can just overload them at their insertion into the calcaneus, and so then it pops. Um, if you're bored, there's a really good video of, um, what's that old English guy, really good soccer player, Beckham, right? Uh, David Beckham? Yeah, that sounds right. Anyway, um, I say old, he's like 40 something, but that's old for a soccer player. Um, anyway, there's a good video of David Beckham where he, he's kind of like, he's in plantar flexion and he leans back as he's about to kick the ball. So it forces his foot in the dorsiflexion and just pops his Achilles. Like it's this really um, fairly minor uh, load, but it's enough. Um, so with Achilles uh, ruptures, those are typically men. And usually I think the average age is like 44. So kind of middle-aged men. Um, so I'm really in that prime demographic for snapping my Achilles. Um, and usually what happens is that forced dorsiflexion. So the foot gets forced up into uh, dorsiflexion as the gastroc and soleus are contracting. So again, overloads them at their insertion. Most of the time, there's some level of inflammation that precedes it. So maybe they've had some tendonitis going on for a while, and then they get that forced dorsiflexion, and then it snaps. That's a pretty common um, presentation, but it doesn't always have to be that. When I was in grad school, our... Um, one of our team physicians for the, for the football team um, was out deer hunting and he was coming down the step ladder from his, um, his deer blind. And so he just hit the step wrong, forced his foot up in the dorsiflexion and he popped his Achilles. Um, so it can be something like that where it's just one big load. So, um, and so this is a picture of kind of the aftermath. So obviously on the left side there, um, you get pretty significant swelling. You don't have that nice defined Achilles like you have on this side. So all the swelling sort of occludes it. You can't see it. Um, the test for that is called the Thompson test. It doesn't really need a name, but that's what it's called. And so to test if somebody's ruptured their Achilles, one, you ask them, hey, can you plantar flex? And they will, they'll still be able to plantar flex, um, but it's going to be really weak. And so what you do is you actually just grab their calf and squeeze it. Because if you squeeze their calf, their foot should move. But if their Achilles is ruptured, there's no connection there between the calf musculature and the foot. So when you squeeze their calf, you're not going to get any foot movement. So that's considered a positive Thompson test. Um, so one of the interesting things about ruptured Achilles is that they are one of the injuries that tends to be a real career ender. Um, because, so I was looking at a study recently where they looked at athletes in um, the NFL, NBA, MLB, and NHL. Uh, Achilles ruptures didn't really matter in the NHL or MLB interestingly, but in the NBA and the NFL, 
only about two thirds of the athletes made it back from the injury. And even after they made it back, they still only had about two thirds as much playing time and, um, or only played in two thirds as many games and only had about half as much playing time. So they were back, but they weren't really back. And I think you kind of like, I'm not a huge follower of basketball, but I think you could kind of see that like with Kobe, you know, prior to his retirement, like it, my impression was he wasn't quite the same guy um, after the Achilles injury. And I wonder about that, like for Kevin Durant, he's supposed to be back this year, right? Like, but he, cause he wasn't back last year. Yeah. He was, he was yeah. So I, I wonder like what he's going to look like um, this year. It'll be interesting to see. Hopefully he can get back. Did he tear his too? Okay. All right. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how, how they recover. And then, you know, if with better rehab, better surgical techniques, if those numbers change at all, but, um, for your just average person, about one in five people can't return to their previous level of activity and then still show pretty significant strength deficits on the injured side, even seven years after the injury. So trying to tear your Achilles, it's a big deal if you do. You won't be quite the same afterwards, probably. At least not if you're an athlete. All right, so three more muscles. So that's our posterior superficial. Now we're posterior deep. So there's three muscles in the posterior deep compartment. And one of the ways to think about it is basically that it's a mirror of the anterior compartment. So remember on the anterior compartment, we've got tibialis anterior. Well, in the posterior deep compartment, we have tibialis posterior. In the anterior compartment, we have extensor hallucis longus. Posterior compartment, we have flexor hallucis longus. Anterior compartment, extensor digitorum longus. Posterior compartment, flexor digitorum longus. So you just flip everything. So tibialis anterior becomes posterior, the extensors become flexors. So here's your tibialis posterior. So tibialis posterior, um, it's the, the deepest of the three in that posterior deep compartment. So it kind of gets hidden by flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucis longus. You can see it there. Um, its tendon is the most anterior of the three. It just runs right behind the medial malleolus. Um, it has a pretty broad insertion. So it's gonna insert across the cuneiforms, also inserts across three metatarsals, across their bases, uh, and then on the navicular. So big insertion. And so the tibialis posterior muscle is often the one that people point to as being the most responsible for holding up your medial longitudinal arch. So between tibialis anterior and tibialis posterior, particularly tibialis posterior, that's what's gonna help hold up that medial longitudinal arch. And then, uh, so in terms of actions, so the actions for all of the muscles in the posterior deep compartment, they're all plantar flexors, talocrural, and they're all inverters, subtalar. But the other two have two additional things that they do. So flexor halysis um, is also a, a toe flexor, as you would imagine. And so again, halysis is the big toe. So flexor halysis flexes your big toe at both the MTP joint and the IP, IP joint of the first toe. So again, still a plantar flexor, still an inverter. And in addition to that, also flexes at the MTP and IP joints. So I mentioned if somebody ruptures their Achilles that they're still able to plantar flex. And the reason that they are is because of muscles like flexor halysis, tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum that we'll talk about in a second, and then the two perineal muscles um, in the lateral compartment, peroneus longus and brevis. So all of those are accessory plantar flexors. So even if you tear your Achilles, you can still plantar flex, just not strongly enough to walk quite normally. All right, and then our last muscle, oops, there's our flexor halysis, uh, second picture of it. All right, last muscle, flexor digitorum longus. So just like flexor, or sorry, just like extensor digitorum longus. So one, uh, one belly, one tendon that splits into four affects toes two through five. So it is a uh, flexor of digits two through five at the MTP, PIP, and DIP joints. So uh, it is an agonist for all of those motions. Do you mean antagonist? Oh, so antagonist would depend on the motion we're talking about. So if we're saying that it's a plantar flexor, an antagonist could be a dorsiflexor, so tibialis anterior, or extensor digitorum longus. If we're saying it's an inverter, then you pick an everter, be an antagonist, that makes sense. Yeah. So its actions are, are those. Um, so plantar flexion, inversion, and then flexion of the toes, not the big toe. And then that's it for the muscles. So um, next week on Monday, we'll talk about gait, which I've kind of hinted at some of the things we'll talk about, like the different phases of gait um, and the importance of the subtalar joint. So we'll talk about gait on Monday. 
And then we have the axial skeleton and a few more muscles. I did add some, a few more muscles on uh, Wednesday and Friday of next week. So yeah, and then, then it's all online all the time. And Thanksgiving break. <laughs>